Okay, Wednesday at 3 p.m., Energy in America. We are so happy to have Lou Pugliarisi of ePrink. He's the CEO of ePrink on the line with us uh, from Washington, D.C. There are so many things happening these days. We want to catch up with you about all of them, Lou. Welcome back to the show. I'm happy to be here, Jay. So uh, first, let's talk about, you know, the biggest thing that happened this week in Washington, namely uh, the State of the Union message. And I'd like to hear your thoughts about how it affects it involves, uh, it, it teaches us anything about energy. Well, let me say, you know, one thing, I, 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 you, know, I, you know, these State of the Union speeches are very much a political theater, right? I mean, they're an attempt for the president who commands the whole room. He gets this coverage, and the Democrats in this case have to do a counter message, but generally by the time you give your counter message, everyone's turned the TV off and gone to watch Netflix <laughs> or something. So if you're the party in power, you have a lot of leverage. Yeah. I, I do think, you know, here's one thing I don't think anyone uh, noticed in the speech. Okay, It's sort of an energy in America. The president did not mention the word coal one time. Ah, so he, may, he may have changed his mind about coal, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think, you know, that coal is... Uh, you know, they sort of done their thing on coal, and it uh, turns out that, uh, yeah, he. I think uh, many of his constituencies appreciate uh, that. Uh, you know, he 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 showed some attention to the dilemma they were facing and all the problems. But in the end, uh, the, the national uh, power sector in the U.S is going to be moving in the direction of natural gas and more renewables. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, we might see some uh, moderation of the decline in coal use in the utility sector, and who knows, we may be able to prevent the complete retreat of uh, nuclear power. I'd also like to point out that this morning, Ernie Moniz, who was... Secretary of Energy under President Obama, and uh, Dan Jurgen, the famous energy guru, the head of uh, you know the vice chairman of IHS Sierra, I mean IHS uh, Market, he was author of the Prize. He and Moniz issued a report, partly funded by Bill Gates, basically saying the U.S. cannot move to a fully renewable power sector by 2040 or even 2050. Mm -hmm. So let me so, ask you this. Could could yes. the U.S. do more about moving to renewables if there were a comprehensive bill, a package uh, in Congress? Not that they have time for such a thing right now because they seem to be, you know, uh, distracted by many other issues, uh, not not even close. <laughs> but but assuming, assuming they had the political will, assuming they wanted to meet that date, uh, assuming they're, you know, they had good advice and so forth on how to do it with a combination of, of sources and all that, um, including LNG, um, could they could they do it? And I suppose my second part is: is there anything pending? Did the president say anything about anything that would be pending on energy in Congress? The president, all, in addition to never mentioning the word coal, he never mentioned the word climate. It's important to remember those two things you didn't mention. <laughs> um, the U.S., uh, it is true that we could do more with a national policy. My own, my own view is that doing more would be largely in the area of research and development. I believe a lot of the subsidies, a lot of the demonstration facilities, a lot of these so-called renewable portfolio standards are both costly and not not giving you much bang for the buck. Mm. We need, and I think this is that's what Gates is talking about in the work he had uh, uh, Ernie Moniz and Dan Jurgen do, is that we need breakthroughs, right? We need fundamental changes in the cost of the technology. 
As you recall, a few weeks ago, we showed a slide or a picture of the growth in electricity prices in the nation oh, since, oh, since, oh, since 2010 and the growth of electricity prices in California. In California, which has a very aggressive renewable program, somewhat like Hawaii, but they have a different kind of alternative sources to, to gain from. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can't hear uh, Lucian right now. We're going to take a short break. We'll come back and try to connect better with him. Uh, this is Energy in America. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Lucian Pulirisi. We'll be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Our flagship energy show among the six energy shows we have is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. It plays every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Come around and see us. Learn about energy. Keep current on energy on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. You can catch me every Wednesday, alive at five. I'll see you there. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Lou Pugliarisi, the CEO of eBrink in Washington, D.C., talking about energy in America and specifically what legislation might be helpful, useful in order to reach um, a goal, I'm not saying what year, but a goal in say 2030, 2040, uh, that would help us uh, you know, achieve renewables in, in a larger percentage. Uh, who's to say 100% or what? But um, what, what, what is your thought about the legislation? What is your thought about this administration? Are they doing anything? And could they do more? So of course you could always do more. The question is what the cost effective strategy is going forward. Right? What are the major research um, achievements you need to do? And I, once again, I have to refer to the breakthrough study that was issued this morning by, uh, uh, you know, uh, Energy Futures Group. Um, one thing that people don't like, but which is an enormous source of power and a carbon-free power is nuclear power, right? This is not an issue for Hawaii because the scale is too small. But for the continental United States, um, I think, you know, Moniz, he pointed out that, look, you need nuclear power. The environmentalists who resist this, we, we have new technologies of nuclear power that can deal with waste management. And nuclear power produces a lot of energy at zero carbon emissions. It tends to be expensive. But it's not as expensive as some of the renewable alternatives. So the future of a lesser carbon-emitting power sector, a lesser power-emitting uh, energy use in North America, requires more gas, more nuclear power, and probably you know more carbon-efficient automobiles. And that will allow more electric vehicles to, you know, right now most electric vehicles in California are coal-fired. Okay? People don't want to say that, but that's what, mm -hmm. what the case is. And then I think the other dilemma, the other dilemma that politicians and 
thorny-headed academics and all the well-meaning union of unconcerned scientists is what does this stuff cost? And unless, unless the sort of community of researchers and proponents of a more uh, carbon-free environment can present to the American people a strategy which is cost-effective, right? And if they can do it in a way without lying to them, telling them it's free, uh, we're not going to get a lot no. of price. It's yeah. very expensive, okay. and, and there's a priorities question. Yeah. Are you going to spend the money on universal health care uh, or right. you know, on energy? And, and they're both big big bills, and which which is more important, and what what's the timing? This is uh, this is an issue we should follow you and me, Lou, as we go forward, because I think it'll be uh, it'll be on the on the radar all the time. But let's move south for a moment. Let's move to Mexico City. You were there at a conference uh, just a week ago, and I'd like to find out what happened because we're actually on the way to Caracas. Uh, so you can tell us about what's going on in, in energy in Venezuela. So let's let's make a stop in Mexico City on the way to Venezuela. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I participated in the uh, Energy uh, Mexico 2019, which was uh, both the petroleum and the power sector in Mexico. And there's two or three kind of issues now. First, Obrador is uh, uh, a populist, as you know. He uh, has uh, 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 opened the state mansion. To, as a museum, he doesn't live there anymore. He has turned the Mexican plane, airplane, you know, the state airplane, uh, put it out to be sold. He travels coach class when traveling around Mexico. <laughs> in fact, one of our uh, one of our researchers in Mexico City showed me a photo of her girlfriend who took selfies with Obrador in the coach cabin going from Mexico City to Veracruz. So. Uh, he is extremely popular, but I would say the the new regulators and the chief of his administration have very little, you know, genuine deep knowledge about energy, and the Mexicans are going to have to uh, deal with or under, come to understanding in the next couple of years what do they do about cheap gas from the United States. Because right now, the U.S. produces lots of natural gas. Some gas in Texas is actually, you have to pay to take it away. Mexicans are using this gas to replace fuel oil and clean up their environment. Air quality in Mexico City is very high. It's very nice. Um, and the new energy model of the last administration, which allows for private development of Mexican oil and gas reserves, is generating a lot of revenue. And one of the uh, one of the miss missions of uh, President Obrador AMLO, as we call him, is uh, to address these problems of poverty in Mexico. And you know, as we discussed before, Mexico is a modern industrial economy. It's not a major exporter of, of energy. It is an energy user. So it's going to be very interesting how AMLO addresses these problems. Uh, because he, he moved into office with a very populist message that Pemex would do more. And, and, and so one of the things we're trying to do is engage with the right people down there and say, okay, mm. what does the research show? What do the conditions show? What's really the right strategy for you guys? Yeah, In well, the end, it's the Mexican your, your trip down there and uh, your reporting on this and, and, and the development of Mexico as a mm, closer to a first world country. Uh, maybe it is a first world country already, it shows that what happens below our border uh, is very important, perhaps more important now than it has been. And what happens below right. Mexico is also important, um, perhaps more important than it has ever been. And we have, we have a, a huge um, uh, degradation in the, in the quality of life and the economy and, and for that matter, oil exports from Venezuela. And I would really like to get your thoughts on what is happening with oil in Venezuela uh, and how that's likely to play out vis-a-vis -vis the, the United States and, for that matter, other countries who, who, who import oil from Venezuela. Right. So, as you know, the, uh, the, uh, under the Venezuelan Constitution, 
um, the head of the National Assembly, Gaido, right, mm-hmm. has uh, assumed the presidency of Mexico. And one of the issues here is how to, you know, w- what reaction should uh, Mexico's trading partners, uh, the international diplomatic community, how should they address this ongoing crisis in Mexico? And one of the things that, uh, that is happening with these new set of sanctions by the administration is the United States was one of the first countries to uh, recognize uh, the uh, new assembly president as the interim president of Mexico. And I think we have a, uh, a couple of pictures to show here. So maybe we could put the, for the first one, maybe to show you what, what's going on with Mexico and the crisis in Mexico. Right? Okay, let's put that and, first picture uh, up. Yeah, okay, we can start with this picture. I think this picture is very interesting because you could take a look at who recognizes Guaido as the interim president, right? In the beginning, it was just the U.S. and a few Latin American countries. This is pretty recent, and you can see now that uh, Canada, the U.S.A., almost all of Latin America, uh, and uh, most of the European Union, uh, I recognize them. Oddly enough, Mexico is still kind of calling for new elections or on the sideline. Uh, and so what you have here is a really interesting um, diplomatic outcome because you have a series, you have Maduro, who is a kind of terrible, uh, terrible dictator of also mismanaging the whole national economy, impoverishing once the richest country in Venezuela. And he's supported by a real cast of pariah characters, Russia, China, probably North Korea, Cuba. (laughs) And on the other side, all the world's major democracies are recognizing Guaido. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things the U.S. has done, and which they're getting a lot of cooperation, is they have essentially going to be winding down by the summertime, all U.S. company operations in the Mexican oil and gas fields, right? But uh, there's a little-known thing people I don't think have understood. The U.S. immediately is, I mean, I think not immediately, within the next two months, will be banning the export of something called diluent. And diluent is a very light petroleum product. And that light petroleum product is essential for blending into the very heavy crude in Venezuela for its export market. Mm. And a third part of it is that the sanctions the U.S. imposed on Venezuela, and the U.S. is one of the, is probably the main purchaser of Venezuelan crude oil, because we use its heavy crude oil in our very sophisticated refiners. The Venezuelans will be permitted to continue to export this to the U.S., but any funds from that sale will uh, be uh, put into escrow, and the administration is looking for ways to let the, uh, the new interim president get access to it. Mm. Uh, this particular picture doesn't provide a full view of the rapid decline in. Uh, I think we lost part of the picture there, but through. But I can just tell you now that. From August of 16 to today, Mexican, I mean, Venezuelan production is down six to 700,000 barrels a day. And uh, so much of the Venezuelan production has been committed to repayment of loans to Russia and China. And it's going to be very interesting to see particularly how China deals with this, because it is clear that their major markets throughout Venezuela and throughout the rest of the world looks to China and say, look, these guys are bad actors. You're probably going to, you know, take a little debt restructuring here. You've already done. You're probably going to take a lot more. But do you really want to be seen backing this thug who is impoverishing the Venezuelan? Mm. Well, but for now, uh, they're friendly with him. And for now, they're happy to have his oil, yeah? And for now... Uh, right, but... 
Yeah, go ahead. They had to rest- they had to restructure uh, many of their loans to Venezuela, and whatever they were getting, let's say two to three years ago, that's been cut back dramatically. So the the Venezuelans are continuing to repay the Chinese, but. They're kind of like a deadbeat renter. They're just paying them a little bit every month. They're uh-huh. not repaying the loans in any right. <laughs> in any substantial way. Teasing so the Chinese the loan, are, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so I'm wondering what you know how this is going to affect world oil markets. Maybe it's already affected world oil markets. What percentage of world oil comes from Venezuela? Um, where does it so, go, and uh, how does it affect the uh, the price at the pump, for example? Yeah, so right now we think that uh, think of the world oil market and the world oil suppliers produce about 100 million barrels a day. One quarter of the world's production is produced by three countries today, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico worth about a trillion dollars a year, and it's a net exporter to the world market. And as a result of the shale revolution, improvement even in Mexico under the previous administration, the continued expansion in Canada of some of the heavy oil, even though there's been some setbacks, that uh, this North American production platform is a net exporter of oil and gas to the world market. Venezuela represents about 1% of world production. And uh, because so much has declined, and with oncoming production in some other parts of the world, our particular view is this is going to have no effect. We're not going to even notice it at the pump. Mm. And most of the pre- so, if you were going to put uh, petroleum sanctions on Venezuela, now's the time to do it. <laughs> okay. Now, well, what would it take? What would it take for that chart to reverse itself, Lou? The chart was down so, to six to seven hundred yeah, yeah. thousand uh, yeah. barrels a day. So, w- what would it take to go way up into the millions? To restore Venezuela's um, production platform, let's say, is going to be at least ten years. Oh, hard wow! Work. Wow! Now you can get some improvements early on, but to get back to the, you know, the uh, heyday years or the Alicon days of the 70s, early 80s, it's going to be at least 10 years, and it may take much longer. And restoration of the Venezuelan economy is going to be an enormous task for the entire world. I just think the amount of damage Chavez and Maduro has done to the Venezuelan infrastructure, to the national economy, to the people of Venezuela, there's been such a huge brain drain. It's going to be a Herculean task. It's going to take quite an effort. Oh, that's so tragic and because it was it was really a, getting to be a very advanced country uh, in the direction of Mexico, as you described it. And it was a middle class there. There was a certain yeah. level of democracy there. And this is a huge step backward. It is, in the 1970s, Venezuela was the richest country in Latin America. Mm. Yeah. So um, is, it, is it too simple for me to say that if Maduro stays in power... Uh, the oil production numbers will stay down, um, but if uh, they will, Guido stays... They, they will continue to crater because in the absence of getting access to diluent, this very light, uh, sweet petroleum product, Venezuela is in a very serious position. They will not be able to... Their capacity to produce uh, crude oil and actually prepare it for export to world markets is going to decline dramatically. So uh, however serious the situation now, it's going to get much worse, much quicker. And so the question is, as you know, the Venezuelan uh, military uses uh, maybe several thousand Cuban uh, assistants, intelligence officers to maintain control. They've lost one general, has defected, but, uh, and I think as the, I think the thinking is, as the funds get kid up, cut off and the corruption opportunities decline, uh, at some point the military will turn against Maduro. Mm. Might not be the generals, but it's usually the colonels that do this. Yeah, and the people in the streets. We had a show yesterday from some Venezuelan people who could speak to this. 
Um, the people in the streets uh, all favor Guaido, and the, the likelihood is if you, if you put it to a vote or if you, if you let the people decide, uh, they would, they would uh, favor Guaido right away, immediately, and Maduro would be out of a job. So let me offer you one piece of advice. You know, I know you go to these <laughs> conferences. You go to conferences about oil and gas everywhere in the world. We follow your, your tracks. Uh, I think we should have a map on the wall of all the cities you've been to in the past year. Maybe you have a map like that. Would you please, at least until we speak further, would you not go to any conferences in, in Caracas? All right, stay, stay out of Venezuela. I haven't been to Venezuela for over 15 years, and I'm not planning to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lou. It's great to catch up with you. I look forward to our next great. discussion two weeks hence. Uh, aloha yes. and happy Valentine's Day. Aloha. Thank you. <laughs>